How's it hanging? Boys and girls, your boy BQ back again in the place to be. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review for May 9th, 2024. This is heighted by main event tag team match of the ABC versus Cheeseball Fountain. This is Cheeseball, Mike Bailey, and Trent. I'll have a number seven with a Coke. Pretty solid episode. Pretty solid episode. I feel like I say that more often than not. Um... It, it was a good one. It was, it was a good one. I was um, wondering how they were really going to bounce back from from uh, recording in Las Vegas, which last time it happened, it went from Las Vegas to Orlando, and there was a huge drop off in the show. Uh, dro- you know, dro- drop off in the, I mean, the quality of the show, the vibe of the show, the audience, you know. But uh, I thought it was a seamless transition this time around, and. I didn't notice anything production wise that really stood out, you know, anything negative. Usually those things jump out at me immediately Uh, a little bit with like Jim Miller backstage, but I mean, that's a given. It's going to look like that every single time. But other than that, you know, I thought it was a pretty, pretty easy episode to watch. Like I like to say easy to digest. So if it's your first time here, this is the number one place to be for the TNA fan. So um, consider that subscribe button. And of course, give me your thoughts in the comments, uh, what you thought about the episode. Give me thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle, thumbs up my ass, whatever. Uh, actually, please don't do that. Let's get into it, though. Um, this is this was also highlighted by a celebration from the, uh, I was going to call them the influence, I don't know why, but the system. And we know how these always play out, right? There's a faction, a wrestler, whatever, they're going to get out there and they're going to celebrate a championship win, someone is going to uh, interrupt. It's no different than a contract signing or someone's going through a table. It's kind of the same shit every time. Uh, but the system gets out there. I th- I feel like the system have had a couple misses on their promos in the last couple months. And it's mainly Moose. <laughs> but Moose comes out here and he's dropping sports references. I am under I, I, the belief that very few wrestling fans follow real sports that closely. I'm not saying all of them. Um, I've been, I tweet this out and I, I write on social media all the time when Dave Meltzer is blaming the NBA playoffs for, for Dynamite's ratings. I'm like, yeah, these people who sit on Twitter all day and defend Tony Khan and obsess over Japanese wrestling, they're hardcore NBA fans all of a sudden. Like, you're just... I think you have to watch it with the sports references sometimes. Um, you can do very generalized, you know, talking about a sports team or whatever, but, like, when Moose hit them with the 92 Dream Team, uh, Croatia versus the 92 Dream Team, um... 1992, how fucking old was I? I was like 12 or 13, okay? And I'm older. I'm an older fan. I'm not, I am not someone that, um, I, I'm getting to that point that I really shouldn't be their target audience in regards to my age. And it's a, an extremely dated reference. I know what he's talking about. Number one, because I'm a hardcore basketball fan. Um, I'm very aware of what they did to Croatia in the 92 Olympics. But that, I mean, who boy, uh, r- really, really dated reference. Um, and, and again, you're expecting a crowd that I, I, I would imagine, you know, I, I guess things might be a little different in New York, but I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't go to a wrestling promo um, expecting wrestling fans and no sports. I hope I don't offend anyone with that. I got wrestling, you know, fans who are wrestling fans who watch sports, but I'm just saying the the average freaking fan. You know what I mean? Uh, Eddie's hair finally looks good. I thought he has looked ridiculous on screen for quite some time with the mohawks, the faux hawks. It's never looked good to me. It's always looked silly. It's always looked ridiculous. And he it looks okay now like for once it actually looks all right and it, and it works as a 
a heel hairdo. So uh, if Eddie finally looks good on screen, got to get him to shed a couple. But besides that, uh, he, he's looking good on screen. And then um, Alicia Edwards speaks and says she put together this video. Looks The editing looks very familiar, like the, every video we see on Impact. And um, it's a celebration of what the system has done. And then it's interrupted by Broken Matt. So Broken Matt got into the files and uh, inserted himself into it. And he comes out, and this is the interruption we knew it was going to happen. Someone, so, Something was going to happen at this point. Ryan Nemeth does the run in here. And you guys might have a better finger on the pulse than me. I don't know if this was a Nick Nemeth spot or it was a Josh Alexander spot. It was one of the two. Because you don't just bust out Ryan Nemeth. Um, career jobber for the most part. I think he's a talented dude, but I mean, as far as how we've seen him on TV, how he's been presented, I don't think I've ever seen him win a match. And now you got him mixing it up with all these champions. So, um, he, he is, it, it's one of those spots. I don't know what story they were going with. I, I'm going to assume it was Josh Alexander because remember, he got that random number one contendership that I thought was totally unnecessary. It just didn't fit into any kind of story you know I, I thought it was better to just keep pushing josh with his redemption story rather than okay let's get him back into the title picture so i would imagine this was the josh alexander spot but nick nemeth has uh inserted himself in actually i'm gonna say it definitely is because when they announced the champion soup sandwich at the end of the at the end of the evening they said i don't know if they specifically said but we know that nick is not nick but ryan nemeth is replacing josh alexander so um that's where that was and then the cheerleaders turn and start doing the delete kind of silly but i mean it's whatever gia miller the abc and a lot of shadows are backstage talking and they are really trying to break the abc up and i've i've been saying this ever since it's been happening i don't think it's necessary you can uh, very easily just have them do their own thing and then bring them back together. The, like case in point, the Motor City Machine Guns. You know, there's, there's, we've seen a team recently on screen do this. So why is it so hard for the ABC to do it? Um, not that I'm saying. I guess they have another title match, a rematch. I can't keep up with you know Tom Hannafin's contract contractually obligated to rematches. I guess they have one. I'm like, how many times are these guys going to fight for the title? Like, I definitely agree. Get them out of the tag team picture for a little bit, but to, to split them up is unnecessary. Uh, they they clearly disagree with that. The company clearly disagrees that this is the way to go. But it's so forced. Like, there's no, there's nothing natural about these guys breaking up. They've been, you know, thick as thieves for a couple of years now. And just because Ace Austin, or I think it was Ace, Tried to wrestle in an X division six way or some shit. I mean, I don't remember if it was him or Bay, and I really don't care to be honest with you. Now all of a sudden it's like they're gonna break. I don't know. This story is just it just really really forced to me. I'm not really enjoying it. Then Santino and the blue lights are in the office, and the system runs in, and he lets them know he has a big announcement at the end of the. He has a big announcement coming that he's working very very hard on. This is, you know, this is like a. At college exams, he's he needs a, he needs a couple more hours. He's not prepared. Um, he's had a week to prepare. He's not ready. He, he's cramming at the last minute for his exam. So he's still working very hard on this, uh, and he'll be he'll be announcing it later in the evening. Um, FBI takes on first class, and I had interest in this because I like first class, and I kind of like the FBI too. I mean this this is. They're established as a jobber team. They beat they beat some jobbers at under siege, but this team clearly is not beating anybody. So, um, and, and which is fine. Everyone can't be on a win streak. Everyone can't be hot. Everyone can't be on a run. You know, there's some people that have to take losses. I I argue that too many people take losses in TNA. What I mean by that is there's very few people who have momentum. 
you know, the system has a lot of momentum right now. Outside of that, like you can't really say, hey, this dude's on a win streak. I think I guess Laredo Kid won a couple matches. You know what I mean? He's the hottest singles wrestler in TNA right now. Um, the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but yeah, only, I will say the first class has some wins though. First class has some wins. So I had some interest in this. Uh, AJ Francis had his NWA, NWA debut this past episode. He wrestled Brian Idol, and um, it, it, the booking was a little TNA because it was it went from a one on one match to a hard uh, no no DQ match immediately, and it kind of tells me that AJ Francis mo- is more of a presence on screen. Well, we know this. We know he's more of a presence. His character is more, more of a pre- presence. Him just being involved is of more value to a company than him wrestling. So the, it, it's like, instead of just having him wrestle a match, you're like, let, let's throw some tables and furniture in here unnecessarily. Like, there was no reason for it. And I, I, what I'm circling back to, the reason I'm saying that is because ever since they put First Class together, I've been saying I don't expect him to be one of the main wrestlers in the team. I think they may ex- eventually win the tag team titles. And if that's where they're going with it, then he'll probably remain a member of the team. I can just see them giving Rich Swan a different partner and AJ being more of a manager. I'm trying to think of an example of this because there is one sitting in the back of my head somewhere. And I don't know if it's a TNA example or from somewhere else. It might have been like an early AEW example. But someone who was uh, who was part of a team and then just kind of slowly transitioned to a more of a managerial r- role while someone else wrestled for them. Hopefully that example pops into my head at some point. I can further clarify what I'm talking about. But you guys are smart. You, you get what I'm trying to say. But yeah, first class gets the win against last class, the FBI. Santino was the star of this show. He was backstage with Naked Jake. and. Uh, the Rascals. I've been pretty critical of Jake something lately. He uh, he sounded good here. I thought he he just came back and uh, came came backstage there. He sounded natural, had a little bit of personality. Because with him, it's a lot of just like grunting and groaning and '80s wrestler. And you know, he he just he just showed a little more authenticity when he came back there. He still had no clothes on, uh, but. But he was he was a little more authentic. The Rascals, Rascals concern me right now. They came backstage and did some very bad acting. And I, I say, you know, he says uh, when Santino said, "Hey, he's gonna have a partner of his choice," and I mean, within half a second, Wentz is like, "What? What partner?" You know, it, it's people don't respond to news that quickly. Like it, it's like he. he it was, I don't, I'm struggling to explain what I'm trying to say. It was just very scripted. Everyone knew their lines and it was just really obvious, I guess is where I'm going with it. It, it just, it just, the rascals did not come off natural. Uh, they exercised some bad comedy. They did during the match as well. So I'm a little worried with them because I've always thought that a serious Trey Miguel was the best Trey Miguel. When they kind of put the rascals back together, I'm not going to say they were super serious, but they weren't a comedy act. And they're starting to transition that direction to me a little bit. So I hope that I hope that's not what they do because I think that's the worst version of them. When they were the Treehouse Rascals with with Dez, I did not enjoy that group. I said that many times at the time. Um, when they're when they're serious and they're focused, like that's the best version of them. Because every time they start falling into comedy, they are moving backwards in the card. Every time they get a little more serious, they start moving further in the card. And, you know, Trey in in particular, I think should be higher up on the card at this point in his TNA career. But that's that's what I think does hold him back. A little too much, too much bad comedy. But yeah, I give I give some props to Jake in this, uh, to, to Naked Jake, and then Co- uh, Cody Deaner comes in. 
I've seen a lot of people hate this this Cody Deaner stuff. It doesn't really bother me. He's he's a jobber. As I said earlier with the FBI, like you need jobbers on the card. So he's doing a jobber gimmick, whatever. It doesn't bother me that much. Then uh, Alan Angel's backstage with Khan and Steph Double D Lander. Why are they still on our TV? And, I, and I'm not saying this because I dislike either, because I don't. But what is what is their mission at this point? Khan had a very lopsided, one-sided feud with PCO. PCO is not even on our screen at this point. What was the point? But Khan is 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 there every week. And there's twice now that I've been like, well, okay, well, Khan's out is on his way out of the company. You know, I said it when he lost the feud with PCO, and then when they lost this uh, under you know under siege, I was like, okay, he's done. What what do you do with him at this point? The phrase I keep saying about Khan is, you can't just heat up Khan. You you were heating up him up in the beginning of the year. You got one shot at a at a character like that, and then you can keep it going. But the minute you stop it, like you're not going to get it back. They're not whatever they were building with Khan is not coming back. And then Steph Delander, who, I mean, another lopsided 0-3 versus Jordan Grace, and she's in the champion soup sandwich match. What is, uh, I just, what is their mission? Like, what are, what are they trying to accomplish at this point? This was just like the oddest interview, even though I like the Alan Angel soundtrack stuff. This didn't go anywhere. It was just Alan Angels hitting on Steph, which if you found humor in that cool, I thought it was kind of funny. It didn't it it didn't move anything. Nothing nothing progressed forward here. So it was it was kind of a waste of TV. What's which, which is funny is that these interview segments are supposed to look bad. They look better than the Gia Miller ones. They look better than the Santino backstage angles. You know, they're doing the shaky zoom up cam type of deal that they used to do in TNA a long time ago. I like that camera. I like when they do that. It was something different that the other companies weren't doing. So um, it, I, I just I'm watching this the whole time. I was like, this looks better. This is the best looking backstage segment on the show. And it's they're they're trying to make it the worst, which is just funny. Very funny to me. Um, then we got Jake and Cody Deaner versus Naked Jake. I'm sorry, I gotta give him the full name. And Cody Deaner versus the Rascals. And damn it, the people have decided it should be a to- Texas Tornado tag team match, which is no different than a no DQ, no count out, anything goes match. So that's gonna be that's gonna be the Cody Deaner gimmick. They're just gonna find different ways of putting them in garbage matches. Which, when it's a Texas tornado, they're not necessarily introducing a bunch of furniture to the match. They're not pulling out tables. They're not, you know, uh, there's no cookie sheets, you know. But but they could. It's the same shit, you know. These names, these matches, just all have different names, but they're they're the same thing. I actually thought the, the the match was pretty good. I think they call them former cousins at one point. Like, I didn't know you could be a former cousin. Um, but it's weird that they, it, it, like, kind of full circle have come around and started teaming together again. I would only argue the fact that Cody Diener, whether he's, whether good or bad, and right now bad because he's a jobber, has had much more character progression than Jake. Like he is Jake is the same person from when he broke off the Deaners to begin with, which was I think three years ago. Like he's the same person. Um but he I, I do think they want to put the X Division championship on him. They can probably get him get him to the point that they can put the world title on him. Not anytime soon, but I mean you you can see a path of them getting there. But there's so much more improvement they have to do to the to the naked Jake character. Um, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, 
Tom Hannafin didn't hit us with too many and a kick outs this episode. He was definitely switching it up. Um, but I had to laugh when he said, and a double kick out. Uh, when when uh, there was like a double pin in this match. I thought that double pin was going to be the finish, actually. And I would have had some interest in that because Jake shouldn't be losing. The Rascals shouldn't be losing. But, you know, Dieter's in the match. You can He can lose every single match and it's not going to hurt anything. So ultimately, the Rascals won. The right team won here. The Rascals needed a win. They haven't beat anybody this year. Anybody. I think I beat them at one point. So... Uh, and it doesn't hurt Jake because Jake was on the outside. Jake wasn't the one pinned. He was teaming with a jobber. The right team won. Steve Macklin comes out afterwards and attacks the Rascals. And at first I was like, okay, they're going to debut some kind of tag team partner for Steve Macklin because I know he had, when he first came to Impact, they wanted to him, him to bring... Uh, his partner with him from WWE, the dude, not Gunner, but the uh, Blake, let's see, not Buddy Murphy and Blake, whatever the fuck he was. They were a tag team at one point in NXT, but Blake, whatever. That was part of the Sons of Sons of Man or what the, whatever his freaking tag team was. They wanted to bring him, but he wanted to do his own thing. And over the years, I've like I've been saying, I think the time is coming where they do bring this dude. I mean, I haven't said on the podcast. I've just been saying it to myself. I think they're going to bring that dude at some point or bring someone from Steve Macklin's past because the stories are always that he has these partners, but they're very, very short-lived. They don't trust each other. Um, at some point, he's got to have someone that he he trusts. You know what I mean? Uh, they they got to they got to pair him with somebody because he gets into a lot of tag team style feuds. And that might be a booking thing where they don't know what to do with them one on one, so they just kind of throw them into random teams. That that might be all it is. But I was thinking they're going to bring someone for him, but then Frankie Kazarian uh, pops up, and I still don't understand this pairing and why they even converse backstage. I just know that Frankie's calling him a marine and a soldier, which are two totally different things. Um. I don't I don't really like where that's going. I don't their interactions I don't I don't enjoy very much. I don't think they're going to be a team versus the Rascals maybe. I don't know there there's no debuts on the horizon like, you know, it doesn't appear to be. They're not so maybe it's just this tag team of two guys who don't get along wrestling the Rascals, they're all heels. I don't know where it's going, but I'm interested. I'm interested. And then Gia Miller frantically runs up fake outrage saying, why did you, why did you just do that? Like, remember the rascals are heels. Like, why does she care? And when she ran up, this was before the interaction with Frankie Kazarian. She's like, why did you do that? And he said, I didn't know what the fuck they were talking about. He was saying something like this happened twice. And then again, just like the rascal stuff earlier, she knows her lines. She comes up right away. She's like, what do you mean twice? And he goes, well, the first time is now. The second time was at under siege. Like, I didn't, what the hell were they talking? I, I had no clue what they were trying to portray here, what they were trying to communicate to us. Did he take Trey Miguel out at under siege? This, this was like really messy to me. This whole backstage segment was messy. Um, Tom is interviewing Santana backstage. You know, to music, but it worked, whatever. I thought this was really good for a couple of reasons. Just adding that like backstory to Santana, um, which is a backstory people are really interested in because people are genuinely, as TNA fans, genuinely interested in uh, the redemption story of Santana because everyone loved LAX. A lot of people were curious what can Santana do as a solo wrestler? And that interest even peaked when he was in AEW. And now he, that opportunity is finally, finally coming. And I think it's something people have been asking for. For I mean, ever since I was doing the podcast with Ro the Great, and that was a long time ago. I mean, we probably last podcasted seven years ago. And back then people were talking about what can Santana do as a solo wrestler. 
You know, so this is this is a story people are interested in. The fans are interested because he chose to return to TNA and to sign with TNA instead of like, which I thought he was going to try to go to NXT. You know, I was wrong on that one. So people are very interested in this. They're having him wrestle enough to keep us interested, but also off screen enough to where we want to see him. And then I thought Tom Hannafin sounded very authentic here, which is very different than his play by play. He just he he felt very like natural because he does these outside the ropes interviews and it's still he still um delivers it like he's broadcasting the weather. And this was one where he just he was just, he really felt natural. So I I enjoyed it. I thought this was very well done. Um something that wasn't very well done. I would be shocked if any of you enjoyed this. And this was Gabby Laspiza in the state in in the ring with Ash by Elegance. I don't know who this is. She's clearly a more successful podcaster than someone like myself. I wrote here in my notes she's annoying. Um they name dropped her a few times and I'm like I don't know who they're talking about. I know they had a a, a Gabby something or other who was a she was really pretty. She was their backstage interviewer for a little bit. I think after they had Alicia Toot, I think they moved to her. And that's who I thought it was. And I was hoping because I thought she did uh, really good. I thought she was one of their their best backstage interviewers they've ever had. Um, this girl comes out. I guess she's local to the to the area. Or she's from Jersey, at least. Um, I thought it was pretty bad. I didn't think she was that bad. She had, well, let me say, she had her good and bad. I don't think she's an on-screen character. You know, just because you have a podcast. Like, I'm not an on-screen character. You cannot use me on screen. I don't have that that warmness and that uh, charisma about me. I, I know that. Like, I wouldn't... I didn't think she really worked as an on-screen character. She wasn't terrible, but... This was just, was just a weird segment. And then the personnel concierge comes out. The Iceman. Because you notice they don't call him George the Iceman. It's personnel concierge i struggle with that word uh on the website you know he doesn't have a name so i was i was kind of curious how was he going to answer this question when she was saying what is your name uh i thought it was funny though he's i'm gonna give you a great name a wonderful name a beautiful name ash by elegance and then he brings her out um completely dodging the question but it's also um uh it's also kind of dumb because we know his name. He's been on screen. You know, it, it's a it's a shot at our intelligence. It's like we know he's George the Iceman. He's been, you know, doing the intel, which never seems to be correct. But he was doing the intel and he was doing uh, he's been a ring announcer. He's been, uh, you know, he's hosted stuff on screen, like little segments. Like we know who he is. So we're all freaking idiots now. Um, but this whole segment was not good. It was, it was, you know, the third overly scripted part of the show. Uh, she sounded, you know, like if you're watching AEW, even if you don't, you've probably seen the Mercedes Monet clips online because they're so bad. She, she, she cuts the worst promo in wrestling. And they're very, they're very scripted. She's reciting lines. And that's how this was. That's how this came off. Um, there was just a lot of talking in circles. It was going nowhere. The acting was bad. It sounded like an uh, a rap album interviewed from uh, interlude from the '90s. Like you're just listening to your CD, and then there's this interview interlude, and it's just something you just want to fast forward and get. You just skip and go over to the to the next song, or it's like one of those bad skits still have like at the uh, one of the award shows is like the oscars or whatever and the two the two presenters will get up there and just stare at the camera and recite lines trying to do a funny skit and it's not it, it's kind of just how this was delivered this was this was pretty bad that the ash character is starting to miss and that's what i was saying could not happen for this division i'm not off the train yet but i know people are because she hasn't had a good match. She hasn't had really a good non-wrestling segment. 
I wouldn't put everything that much she's done in the category of being bad, with the exception of the Zia Brookside match and this. And then they announce or they introduce Zia Brookside, I should say. And they're talking about missing jewelry. I think it was the brass knuckles. Like I I don't remember them taking those from her, that being a thing. I I honest to God don't. And maybe that's just me not paying attention. Maybe it's like my ADHD. I, I don't know. Maybe you guys remember that. I don't remember that. And they're going to have a, a match over the freaking jewelry. So her and Zaya Brookside, queen of the rubber match, are going to wrestle again. One match was awful and one was solid. I don't know what we're going to get this time around. But I'm expecting, we're getting the return of bad comedy, folks. Like we were getting away from that. Her match versus Decay or whoever the hell she was wrestling, uh, Havoc, which was very bad, was filled with bad comedy. This was bad comedy. The show is starting to resort back to that. And I have a lot of worries about that. And I expect this match with Zia Brookside to feature bad comedy as well. I mean, if you are if you are wrestling over, this is no, this is someone who are expecting to wrestle for the Knockouts Championship at Slammiversary. But if you're wrestling over jewelry at this point, I am very concerned for your character. It, it's hard to imagine them just pulling the trigger and all of a sudden she's like a serious competitor for the title. Because I still stand by the fact that she will win the title. I stand by the fact that she will beat Jordan Grace. Might be wrong. I'm, I'm, I am sticking by that. Whether it's a good or bad decision, storyline wise wrestling doesn't matter what you think i do think she's winning the title i think i think they're the the company is going to feel like it's got to go on someone else besides jordan at that point because we got to get to the point where jordan is chasing the title back because right now she's just wrestling random people see they they've announced her wrestling marty bell you know which i love marty bell it's my girl but what just you're, you're just throwing opponents at her at this point. So um, we just, Ash has to be a home run. I, I said that from the beginning, like it has to be a home run. And there's just a lot of bad comedy at this point. And I, I laughed too, because when, when, uh, before they brought out Zaya Brookside, this Gabby Laspiza said she had a long meeting with TNA management. So is that why, is that what Santino was doing where he, he didn't have time to put together the, championship challenge or whatever it's called. Why is she meeting with TNA management? So I can't imagine too many of you enjoyed this. They show a quick clip of Joe Hendry talking about his song on the charts, which was smart. There was nothing for him to do this episode. So, you know, squeeze him in there because right now he's hot. He has some momentum. I talked about momentum earlier. You could say Joe Hendry has a little mainly, mainly outside of the ring stuff, but he has some. And then Santino announces the champions challenge, the soup sandwich match. I'm interested in this. Like the graphic is really cool. I'm interested in it. Um, they had the graphic queued up, even though he was working on the match all episode. I think the graphics cool. I think the concept is the concept is cooler on paper than I think the execution might be. When you have this eight on eight match and you've got a mixture of men and women, I don't know what to expect from it. What's really weird to me is that there was no stakes here. I was expecting you know, whoever gets the pin is going to get it. This, this, this is the way NWA would do it. Whoever gets the pin is going to get a title shot. You know, like I, I, that's how the, that's how they book. Like they don't do a lot of pointless wrestling. There's always kind of a lot of it's going somewhere. So this would have just made sense if, like, who, if, if the, uh, someone from the challenging team gets the win, they get a title shot at, no way out, no surrender, no can do, whatever the hell is is the next show. Um, I, w- I just would have went that direction. 
they, it seems like they're just wrestling. They're just having a match. And I, I would I would argue there's not a lot of grudge involved here. Some of the people they're throwing into the match. Steph Delander's in it, who's beat nobody. Like, why why is she in the match? This knockouts division. There's no improvement from week to week. It's it's been in a really bad place from the top of the year. And aside from adding Zaya Brookside and Ash by Elegance, which happened right at the top of the year, they have done nothing to improve this division. Once Kylan King got hurt, once you knew Trinity was leaving, once you knew Deanna was leaving, once you knew Mickey James was leaving, like they, it wasn't like these, these things happened out of the blue. Maybe Kylan King's injury to an, to an extent, but you had a lot of people leave, and they've done nothing to, to replace them. Now, I'm sure they're talking to some people. I'm not going to sit here and, oh, they're sitting on their hands and doing nothing. But I've used the NWA example before. Like they've lo- they lo- they've lost Camille, they lost Thunder Rosa. You know, people who are their champions. Um, they'd lost like prominent names in their division, and there was always backup plans. Whether it was someone on the roster, or they just found someone some way to bring someone in and freshen things up. They always have done it with their division. The company is smaller than TNA, so there's no examples. I mean, no ex- examples, no excuses. And there's just they're just not bringing just Jordan Grace wrestling random matches against people from Japan, and no one's no one's hot, you know. the The best story in the Knockouts division right now is Alicia Edwards being the tag team champion. You know, so they're just they're just not doing anything for this division. And here's Steph Delander again, like she's the ultimate break glass in case of emergency knockout. In 2024. So, um, again, I have some interest in the match, but it's it just sounds like a soup sandwich. Like it just sounds like something that's just gonna fall apart. There's no there's no foundation. Like it's just gonna like crumble immediately. I just don't see how this can be a good match. But I hope that they prove us wrong. I think that I think I think most fans have interest in it. I think they want to see what what comes out of this. But it's just so weird that it's. It just randomly throw together with no no stakes, you know. I just I just don't understand that. Maybe that's how they get Broken Matt to the world title. Like, okay, so we know Brett Broken Matt's going to wrestle for the world championship. Like, it's very clear, but they lost it under siege. So it's like, well, how how are they going to get there? What's the path? If they had the soup sandwich match and said, okay, whoever gets the pin on the exp- if the opposing team wins. They get a title match. Whoever or or if the champions pin someone on the opposing team, that person will never get a title match in 2024. I mean, throw some 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 kind of stakes, but this could have been your path to Broken Matt getting his world title shot. Maybe it still is, but um, all I know is that this team of champions has no business losing. They don't. If you're putting that many champions together and four of them are a faction. There's no reason they should lose. So we'll we will see what they what they do next week in the goat rope match. Um, what do we got after this? Uh, oh, they had Jonathan Gresham versus Will Ferrara. The announced team kept calling him Will Ferrara, the son of Ed Ferrara, the guy who co-wrote the Attitude Division, right? I mean, the, the Attitude um, Era, not the vision. Son of Ed Ferrara. Um, this was a little too competitive. They're still feeling out the Jonathan Gresham character, which I think people have interest in as well. Then they did a little back, not a backstage, but a um, a video vignette of Gail Kim pulling up to some random spot in the middle of Canada, I guess. And uh, Giselle Shaw was there doing... She was meditating. So that's that's different than the Giselle Shaw's diva character, right? Um, if you remember, they were starting to lay the groundwork of Gail Kim trying to get um, Giselle Shaw to fire the Shaw entourage, which is what happened. You know, they were they were laying groundwork of like you don't need them. 
and it's it's good for Giselle to be off TV because no one takes more L's. That she, you know, she's got two L's in her name. It's it's fitting. Uh, she t- takes nothing but losses, and they had to do something different with her. I thought as the quintessential diva, she could have been the knockouts champion and had a pretty decent and entertaining run, but they just never went that direction. They, she wrestled a lot for the title, and it just never went that direction. She's the only person at this point that could that you could buy beating Jordan Grace just because we know she's good. Like she doesn't beat anyone, but we know she's good. So it's like it is a character you could probably heat up if necessary. I don't think she's going to be the one to do it. I think it's going to be Ash by Elegance, but I'm just saying you could with Giselle. And especially if Gail Kim is mentoring her, you know, this could be interesting. At first, when we see the heel, you know, the 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 pump. I don't, the women still call them pumps, but the the heel step out of the car and she's walking. At first, I'm like, who are they debuting here? But then my gut told me they have debuted nobody this year. It's always they they do these things and it's someone from the fucking roster. It just it just has been in 2024, and um, that's what it was. It was Gail Kim. <laughs> it, was, it was Giselle Shaw. I thought it was initially Giselle Shaw walking. Actually, when they showed Gail Kim from a distance, I thought that was Giselle, and then it showed Giselle sitting, and I was like, wait, who the hell was that? It was Gail Kim. So it's always good to see Gail Kim on screen. We should have more Gail Kim on screen. It's unfortunate that they decided she's not should not be the authority figure, and maybe she just didn't want to be. But I think the show would have much more benefited from her calling the shots than Scott Demore and Santino. I think if you had Gail Kim in that role, it would just be a lot more uh, entertaining. Maybe entertaining is not the right word because Santino is entertaining, but just I think it would have been the fans would have accepted it more because it would have been a more serious role. Um. You know, so we'll see what they do here. I'm interested. I'm very interested. I'm glad Giselle has not left the company. I know, I believe they said she was hurt, but I'm I'm glad she's not gone. Always, always been a fan. And Gail Kim says we need to talk. So, you know, what she can say, please come back and save the knockouts division. We've got Ash by Elegance versus Zaya Brookside three coming next week. Like, please. And then we get a Champions Challenge commercial. They actually called Alicia, Alicia Edwards in that. And then we got the main event, which was ABC versus Cheeseball Fountain. Cheese, Cheeseball Mike Bailey and Trent all have a number seven with a Coke. Extra sauce as well on the side. Um, they're trying, as I said, they're trying extremely hard because the, the, the stakes in this match was that the winning team was going to wrestle each other for a number one contendership at the at uh, uh, Muhammad Mustafa Ali's X Division Championship, um, I think we it was weird because we knew that we probably weren't going to watch Ace versus Chris Bay again versus you know versus uh, Ali, so I think it was pretty obvious that uh, Mike Bailey or Trent Seven were well, not or, and that they were going to win the match. Even though storyline-wise, it would make sense for ABC to split and wrestle each other, they're they're still going to get there. And I don't know how much I cared about the match watching it because I just knew, I kind of had an idea how it was going to end. And they're, tr- I mean, they are trying so hard to break these up. It is the most forced split in wrestling when Ace Austin was outside yelling at Ali and, and you know, of course Tom has to be like, Oh, is that why they lost? Because he stepped away to go have a conversation. Like (sighs) these guys must have a very shaky friendship if they're breaking up over shit like that. I mean, seriously, it's not like Ace Austin uh, disappeared for half the match. He was, he was yelling at this dude and he jumped back up fairly quickly. Um, we're going to get Mike Bailey versus Trent Seven in a one-on-one match. Trent Seven's probably going to win, I think. Uh, even though, on paper, Mike Bailey versus Ali probably is more interesting. If this match is going to be at whatever Impact Plus show, Trent Seven sounds like the opponent to me. 
And then maybe when Slammiversary comes around, then you get the Mike Bailey match. So you got you guys agree with me on that? I, I think, um, I mean, and, and Ali is clearly running through tag teams. He'll he'll wrestle both guys in a tag team and beat them both. So I, I just I, I can very well see a progression of um, Trent. I'll take a number seven and then uh, cheese ball after that. So that's what that's what I think they're going to do. We'll see if that's what it is. And they are trying extremely hard to break up the ABC. And that's why this match was put together to begin with. For them to either not get along or for them to win and wrestle each other and split. You know, so do you guys want to see the ABC broken up? Like, do, does anyone, is that what anybody wants? Whether you like them or not, like they're not my favorite team, but as as much as this tag team division is hurting, that's what you want to do. And then you're even you're even teasing or you're even flirting with having to break up Cheeseball Mountain if they're going to be wrestling each other. I don't think they will, but you're still you're still kind of like flirting with the concept of it. So um, the other, uh, you know. They've got a tag team of a Steve Macklin and Frankie Kazarian that don't even get along. This is another division. The right down the knockouts and the tag team division in very bad positions. And the tag team division is so funny because we will have this like period where it is just fat and it's just got talent and it's just got options. And then it crumbles within an episode or within a set of tapings. It just completely crumbles to nothing. And then they rebuild it up. They sign some guys for three months they get their title match and then they're then they're gone so there's just there's just a pattern here but they they've got a lot of work to do with this um this roster right now there's a lot of talent there's um you know the talent at the top is a little a little heavier than it has been the um, x division as long as ali is the champion is in very good hands because he's doing such good work it doesn't matter who he wrestles but I mean the the tag team division, the knockouts division. I don't know if it's a division, but the digital media division. I mean those those need saving right now. Um, we're getting Laredo Kid in the main event next week. That's that's pretty interesting. So that's gonna do it uh, for my impact review this week. Let me know, of course, what you guys thought. I thought I thought overall it was good. Like there were some very bad segments here. It, it was. Anything that involved acting was bad. The wrestling itself was not. The rest, I mean, when is the wrestling bad? It, it usually isn't. It's usually it's usually really good. But the the backstage stuff, I think, is what held held the episode back. Now the 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 video packages of Santana, uh, Giselle Shaw, those benefited the show. But it's when when someone's got a microphone in their hands, whether it's Gia Miller, whether it's the wrestlers. Um, when it's just any backstage stuff and any kind of any, any kind of uh, interaction with Santino is bad, you know. So they get they gotta gotta get away from it. I think they are, <clears throat> excuse me, going the direction of bad comedy once again, and I, I hope that's not the case. I'm your boy BQ. Thanks for checking me out this week, as always, and uh, got some more content coming this week on the channel. I'm out. Peace.